about three different scientists. And they are at different stages of their careers. We have Isabel Trigger uh, from here at Trier. She is a particle physicist. We have Lars Rose in the back. He is from the National Research Council. He's from the Fuel Cells Institute that talk about fuel cell technology. And we have Andrew Ross, who is from Fisheries and Oceans to talk about ocean science and ocean chemistry. Okay. So we're going to give you about three 10-minute presentations, then we're going to break into a round circle discussion. Uh, and what I'm going to do is ask them some questions, hopefully open the door for you guys to ask questions. I'll be asking them the good ones, like how much you get paid, uh, what kind of vacation you get. So the real good question. So I think we'll start things off with Isabel, and then we'll push through to Andrew, and then we'll go end off on Lars. So with that, Isabel, stage is yours. So I just put together a few slides on the type of stuff that particle physicists do all day. Because uh, most days are different. Um, I thought I'd start with why did I become a physicist? Actually, when I was at your stage, I was going to be a chemist because the subject that interested me in high school was, was chemistry. But it turned out that all the bits of high school chemistry about how the atom works really pushed you into physics, not chemistry. So I, I changed but basically, I just wanted to know what everything is made of and how it works. Um, and you can study that at many different levels. You can be a biologist and figure out how all living things work, or you can be a chemist and figure out how uh, different uh, molecules interact. But the, the very simplest, most basic level, you get to particle physics. And uh, so I liked it because it was the simplest science there was. And I also liked it because it involved a lot of travel. And uh, that. Uh, had a certain appeal. So, to kind of go through the, the life of an experiment, basically the same person does all of these different jobs, although eventually most people specialize. But the, the kind of hardcore experimentalists like to do stuff in their own little lab with their oscilloscope and their soldering iron. And sometimes they have some pet technology and they, they look for detectors to use it in. Um, sometimes they just have you know, a big milling machine on site, so they need to figure out things that need a big milling machine. But um, it, it's fun. Th this is what I did when I was a master's student. I mean, it involved little silicon detectors, which ended up being uh, the type of silicon detectors that got used in the pixels and the silicon detectors in Indianapolis and uh, our competitor CMS. And, and you just test the properties of them, see how they react when you put them in a beam of radiation. Um, this, this is hardcore experiment stuff. But then if you stay in that kind of experiment too long, there's a serious danger of ending up in management. Um, particle physics detectors have all these little pieces of all these different technologies. And at some point, you start needing um, to cover surfaces the size of football fields with some technology. And at that point, you're not testing your little technology anymore. You're arranging with some industrial partner to build several million of them. And quality control and quality insurance. So at that point, the physicist is turning into a manager. Um, and they all have to talk to each other and go to the other sites and make sure that everyone else who's making the components near them isn't putting their heat exhaust places just near their sensitive electronics. And, um, it involves sharing all these big project files. And uh, it is it's management stuff. If you don't want to get into that, the other alternative is software. So that you get these armies of physicists who spend their days and often their nights in front of computers writing software that simulates all the stuff that's going to happen inside the detector. Some of them are doing the physics processes, some of them are doing how the detector will respond to that. There's a lot of programming to do, and um, you can do it on many different levels, everything from sort of fancy graphics down to, to really efficient code to run in the trigger of your experiment to do stuff really fast. Um, so there's every kind of coding, and, and that's that's actually what most of us do most of the time, is sit in front of the computer and write software. Um, then when you've got your detector and it's starting to be built, you have to commission it. And this isn't just a question of flipping the switch and turning it on. Usually you start installing some of the hardware prototypes, put some of it in a test beam and, and try it with a beam of particles and still see if it still works when you're irradiating it. Um, so that this involves going to places where you have the right kind of conditions to do your tests, so some, some lab that has the right kind of theme, and you, you set up your hardware there, and you, you see if it still works, and then you go back to your lab and you do more tinkering. Um, and you try to read it out, so you start talking to the people who've written the software, and 
some of the, sometimes it's the same people. So um, I did this for a while when I worked for CERN. Um, I was working on the alignment system for the, the muon system that lets those big detectors on the outside of Atlas. Those are aluminum tubes up to six meters long, and you need to know where they are within about the thickness of a human hair, so you have quite a fancy optical alignment system on them, and that's what we were commissioning. So we'd get our scaffolding and put the sensors in place and, and then hook up the readout and see if it works. This is kind of the fun stage. And then there, there's running the experiment where the actual day-to-day -day running is kind of a mixture of the experts who are typically the people who are parts of the detector and who really know how they work. And then the people who just sit in front of computers monitoring it for, for shifts every day. Usually we run three eight-hour shifts every day for various parts of the detector. And this involves some poor soul sitting there in a control room staring at pictures on the computer and waiting to see if something goes red or if something starts to look a little funny. So usually that's not something that one person does all the time. It's usually a kind of service work that you do now and then. It's also an excuse to get over to the lab. So you have to go over to CERN to sit in front of your computer and do your shifts. And while you're there, maybe you can go to a few meetings. And if you're lucky, you take in a weekend for skiing. Um, it, it's, um, it's not so bad. And then uh, running the computing for the experiment is, is really a big deal now. It used to be something you'd get a couple of assistants that the LHC spews out enough data that just the stuff we store in Canada, we store it on CDs that would make a pile 10 times as high as the CN Tower every year. Um, so it's a lot of data to plow through, but we have all this grid computing, and this involves more armies of both physicists and computer scientists all over the world making sure that everyone who's doing the commissioning and doing the analysis can get up data wherever they are. So some days you just spend sitting in front of the computer trying to make the access to the data work and be sure that your, your students and postdocs can all get their data. So that's more sitting in front of the computer, but it's, it's a different kind of computing. Um, and then there's the reason why you did all this. This is analyzing the data. So you're buying into the chance to do the analysis, to get all the software that everybody else has written, plus whatever that you wrote yourself, and all the hardware that all those people put together, all of what you need, just so that you can go through the data and run your algorithm <coughs> and sift out the events that are interesting to you and see if you found something that no one's ever seen before or measure something better than nobody else ever has. And that's really the exciting bit, uh, which is why we usually let graduate students do it and write their theses about it. Um, and the way it works is usually you spend a few days thinking of some great way to run an analysis and, and you write some code that does that and you're really happy because you see something um, immediately. And then you spend a few years trying to refine it and figure out the systematic errors. And that's less fun, but you learn more. Um, so in the last stage, once you've done all those different things and decided which thing you like best, is, is telling people about it. Because you know taxpayers pay for us to build these detectors and figure out how the universe works. And it's not just so that we can keep it in our little heads and, and keep it to ourselves. You have to write theses. You have to publish papers. Outreach activities, try and put it into plain English so that the media can explain it to people properly. You have to teach people, supervise students. So there's actually quite a lot of this final phase, which is really important. And some of the fun stuff that we get to do at the end, like this. So typical day is some of each of those. Um, so I don't know if any of that sounds remotely appealing, but I, I like it. 